lesson number eight. And I'd like to finish all of this lesson tonight if we can and sort of speed up the study just a little bit so that we can do one lesson each time we meet. Okay? We want to do one lesson for each time that we meet. All right. The glorious church is like what? It's like a flock. It's like a family. It's like a building. Tonight, it is like a bride. You know, when I think about marriage, there are a lot of things that come to mind, and a lot of times we, we joke and say funny things, but the truth is, marriage is a very serious pact between a man and a woman. It's also a great blessing. And God takes this joining together of man and woman, and He says, that is what the bride of Christ is like to Jesus. It is like the pact between a husband and a wife. All right, I want us to begin... Let's go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Now, I'm going to sort of begin somewhere else just for a moment, but I'm going to ask somebody to read this here in just a second. But there was a man, he was crying in the restaurant, and the waiter was sort of confused. He said, well, why are you crying? The guy told the waiter, he said, you know, my wife said that she wasn't going to talk to me for 30 days. And the waiter, he thought, well, man, that's pretty serious. He said, well, what are you going to do? The guy told the waiter, he said, I don't know. Today is day 29. <laughs> I guess he didn't want his wife to talk to him. You know, that's a pretty serious thing when you think about it. God wants it to be special. God says that marriage is special. The relationship that Christ has with his bride is very special. I think about what God said to the nation of Israel in Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8. He said, he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. God's people have always been very, very special to him. I think about this passage in James chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, Of his own will he begat us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. That means when God looks at the earth, he sees you, the church. He sees you first. The first fruit. If you're there in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, will somebody read that and then we'll begin our study for tonight. Okay. He purchased it with his own blood. Maybe some of your translations say he bought it or he obtained it. It belongs to him. And he paid a high price for it. Now I want to ask you tonight, I don't want you to raise your hand because some of you may not. <laughs> How many of you would die for your wives? I have an idea that every man who is a man would do it. You wouldn't even have to blink an eye. You say, would you die for your wife? You better believe I would. I would believe that you would. I would pay the ultimate price. And Jesus said, I will die for mine too. In fact, I already did. Something that's really neat about all of this is he's already shown the love that he is willing to give. You know, you and me, we could say it, but when it came down to it, you know, we, we may back out, you know. But Jesus has already done it. He's already shown it. All right, let's begin. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. Now, I, I'm going to read this for the sake of time. I'm going to just uh, notice this fairly quickly because it's about 11 verses. But I just want to notice a few things. Now, as I began this study, I, I first thought of this immediately. This is what came to my mind when I was reading the title and sort of thinking about what I was going to prepare for this. And I had already put this in here. And then I realized as soon as I got into this lesson, uh, right there under the letter A, number six, 
he, he inserted the same thing. So it was funny to think that we, we were already on the same page. So I'm going to go ahead and read this uh, where I already had it before. Ephesians 5, 22 through 33. He said, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. He continues, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, and he that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man yet hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall be joined unto his wife. And they too shall be one flesh. Here is the key. The very reason why I thought to even read this is because he said, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning what? The church. It's amazing to see all the applications that are made between the relationship of a husband and a wife. And he said, all of you who are married can relate to what I'm saying. But I'm not really talking about marriage here. I'm talking about the bride of Christ. The church of Christ that belongs to him. Nevertheless, okay, he said, even though I'm talking about the church, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now that's really the key to our lesson is basically summed up in those 11 verses. If you look in your book there under the Roman numeral 2 where the body of the lesson is mentioned, the letter A, capital A says, first the church is called a bride. He gives a list of some scriptures there, and I want to begin in Revelation 21. Let, let's turn over there because he notices verse 2, but I want to give a little more context here and maybe stop just, just for a moment. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 3. John also calls the church the bride. I always have wondered what this means in verse 1. Will somebody read verse 1? Right. I have always wondered what that means. It's not mentioned very much at all in the Bible. I mean, you may find this one or two times that I know of. But I wonder, here's what I'm thinking. I wonder if God is going to remake everything to the way he intended it to be to begin with. But this time, there will be no sin in the garden. Man will not be able to die. You see, I always wonder that. I don't know. But I'm just thinking, you know, God, God created this world. He, he put the, the tree of life there. But in heaven, it will be different. There will be no opportunity for man to fall anymore. There will be no sin. There will be no death. There will be no sorrow. There will be no crying. So I always wonder, you know, if, if he just is going to recreate everything and make it a thousand times better than it already is right now. I don't know. It's weird to think about, actually. You know, he describes heaven in a lot of different ways in this book, and we'll notice that here in chapter 19 in just a moment when he says that the city was made of gold. It looked like it was transparent. The gate of the city had all manner of precious stones. And he gives a list this long of all the precious stones that were on each gate. 
Do I literally believe that there will really be gold there? No, I don't. <laughs> there won't be anything physical there as far as I know. How else would you describe it, though? How else would God tell us in physical language what a spiritual place is going to look like? He uses the most valuable things that this world has to offer. So I thought that was pretty neat. But that phrase always throws me off. I, I never know what that's going to be like. The new heaven and the new earth. Guess we'll find out when we get there. All right, any question or comment before we move on? Okay. It's all going to be a new dwelling place. To say that we're going to have a new physical, better than we've ever had it, is more than pre millennialism, where they argue that Christ is going to come back and on the earth for a thousand years. Yeah. It's not going to happen. That's not going to be here. It's going to be destroyed when Christ comes. Everything will be destroyed. Yeah, I, I, I definitely don't take the view anything physical will be there, but I, I think uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses sort of believe along that line, I think, don't they? that the earth will just be recreated. And yeah, I definitely don't think that that would be true. But I always wonder anytime I see that, what, what that's going to be like. And I, I guess the truth is, we don't really know for sure, but we do know it's not going to be physical. It, it's not going to be anything like dirt and clouds and you know stuff like that that we have today. All right, yeah, that's a good comment. I appreciate that. Let's continue. Look at verse 2. He said, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God, out, uh, out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. You know, I, I like that he inserted that here because to me that's, that's exactly what the church is like. How, how else would you say that the church is to Jesus? I mean, to say that the church was like a cousin would be strange or a brother or, you know, the church. No, the church fits when you describe it as a wife. He continues, verse three. I heard a loud voice from heaven, from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself shall be with them as their God. So that is the day when ultimately we will see him face to face. So that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, will somebody read verse 9 there? I think he's got that under number 2. Revelation 21 and verse 9. Okay, the wife of the Lamb. Now, you keep reading there. He said, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain. He showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and its radiance was like most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. So he, he begins to describe then uh, the elements there that it looks like. We back up to chapter 19. It talks about the marriage of the Lamb has come. The bride has made herself ready. She clothed herself in fine linen. That's the same idea in Ephesians chapter 5. Notice what that linen is. The righteous deeds of the saints. He said, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, this is the true words of God. How many brides do you think Jesus has? The religious world would have Christians and people of all denominations to believe that there are many brides. But we don't read about that in the Bible. You know, in fact, that is, a, that is not a good New Testament concept. And even in the Old Testament is something that God never intended. Can you think of people in the Old Testament who had more than one wife? Can you name some? He had way too many. <laughs> Two.
two is more than enough, isn't it? <laughs> he had over a thousand. I think about David. You go back even further to Abraham. It was common many times in Old Testament days for men to have multiple wives. Did God ever think that that was okay? Just curious, what are you thinking tonight? Not according to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 19. You remember the Pharisees came to Jesus, they're trying to trap him, and, and he said, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And Jesus said three words, or four words, have ye not read? It's interesting to me, they should have known better than this. And he quoted the book of Genesis and he said that even in the beginning it was not so. That a man should leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife and they twain, that means two, should be one flesh. He said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. God always intended for one man to be with one woman. That's the way he made them in the garden. Otherwise, he would have made Adam and three other men and then 15 other women. But he didn't do that. He made one man and he made the woman from the side of the man and the Bible says he brought the woman to the man. And I believe that's always what God intended for that to happen. There was one guy, he said, you want to know what the punishment is for having more than one wife? You get two mother-in-laws. <laughs> There's a much more dangerous punishment than that, I'll tell you that for sure. God has never approved of a man in the Bible having more than one wife. Now, do I believe that men still went to heaven even though they did that? I do. I believe in Acts chapter 2, I think it proves that David is at the, the right hand of God. You say, well, preacher, how do you reconcile that? I guess my only thought is, and my only way to say, is in Acts chapter 17, when he makes reference to a lot of different things that happened in the Old Testament, even the idolatry of those wicked people, he said... At the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17, 30 and 31. I mean, if you learn something else, please let me know. But for as far as Acts chapter 2 is concerned, I mean, he mentions David and says he's in heaven. So anyway, if, you've, if you learn something on that that's different, please uh, teach me. Uh, I would be interested to hear it. But today, I do not believe that a man can be an adulterous man and go to heaven. I don't believe that he can. Especially not after the law was laid down by Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 19. It's just not going to happen. As far as I know, from what I know about the Bible, I mean, if somebody can change my mind, I, I'm definitely open. But uh, I just don't see, see that happening today. Not under the New Testament. All right. Jesus only has one bride. That's what God intended for man to have all along. And it's not going to be any different with Jesus Christ. So look there. Um, lesson number eight, the letter B. He said, second, uh, the bride comes uh, the wife of one groom. I want to back up just for a second. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. Uh, Romans chapter 7. And I, I believe this point could be applied here as well. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul is trying to make a distinction between the Old and New Testament, and he uses also this analogy of marriage. And uh, he says you can't be married to more than one. You can't be married to the Old Testament and to the New Testament law at the same time. It doesn't work that way. 
So then he said in the earlier verses, I speak to them that know the law, how that a man is bound by law to his wife as long as she lives, and a husband is, is bound by law, or a wife is bound by law to her husband as long as he lives. And then he says this in verse 4, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. I like the King James in this one because it, to me it makes it a little more clear. He says, you are married to another. Now, I looked at the definition on that word, and to, to be married is not the main definition of that word. But I love what the King James translators did. They looked at the context. <laughs> Uh, that's one benefit about King James. A lot of times they would uh, consider what's going on around the translation. You know, when you look at the choice of words that you could use for that, there's a list about this long and marriage is way down at, you know, lower in the list. So that's not the main translation of that word. It literally means to belong to or uh, to be attached to or something like that. Uh, but I like the King James translation on that. You be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. So the context is about God says you cannot be married to the Old Testament law and you cannot be married to the New Testament at the same time. And because the old law has been nailed to the cross, what option of a bride do you have? Well, we have the New Testament of Jesus. That's sort of the syllogism that he's using in this argument there in uh, Romans chapter 7. Okay? All right. Any question or comment before we move on? I thought about this that somebody wrote about the purpose of everything we're talking about tonight. You know, what is, what is the purpose of the church? I found this. If you flatter me, I will not believe you. If you criticize me, I will not like you. If you ignore me, I will not help you. But if you encourage me, I will not forget you. That literally is the purpose of the church. God uses this analogy of the most precious person in a man's life. And God says, that's who you are. You are special. So, you know, when, when you feel like you're down on yourself or whatever, you know, you, you may feel like you're having a bad day, at least there's one thing that you can remember. You are very special in the eyes of God if you're part of the church of Christ. All right, number two. Second, he said, the bride comes with one groom. You know, uh, a bride doesn't have more than one husband today. <laughs> Just like a husband doesn't have more than one wife. And uh, I sort of like the idea here that he mentions in several verses, and I'll notice a few of these. Let's go to John chapter 3. He gives a reference to John the Baptist under number 2, the letter B, number 2. He said, John the Baptist, speaking of Christ and his church, said, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Now, I want to I stop right here for a minute. Let's look at some more verses around this. And I like the idea, and I believe this could become a good sermon maybe sometime in the future. There was one boy. He went out in the backyard. He's about six or seven years old, and he had his baseball bat and a baseball, and he throws the ball up, and he swings hard, and he misses. He said, whew, man. He throws it up again, and he swings it, and he misses. He's thinking in his mind, that's, that's strike two. So he's thinking, I've got to hit it this time. And he, he, he gets ready and he throws the ball up and he just swings as hard as he can and he misses again. He said, man, I'm a good pitcher, ain't I? <laughs> you know, there's an innocence that comes with little children that's like that. All four of mine have always had that and I always try to build them up in those areas. I don't ever want to crush a child's spirit. Children need to feel built up. You know, they need to feel like they belong somewhere. They need to feel like their parents are going to take care of them. And what I'm finding here in the study of the church is that's exactly what God is doing for his children. 
Now the concept is a little bit different, but it's also similar. He gives us a way in the world that when we, we swing a strike and we miss, we, we're not crushed by everything that's going on around us. He said, no, look, you put yourself where I can watch, watch over you, keep you safe. That place is the church. Well, somebody read John chapter 3, verses 28 through 30. I want to sort of get a context here of what's going on, and then we'll discuss it a little bit. Do you remember all the details that happened on your wedding day? I mean, there are some things that I remember very, very well, and then there are other things when they're mentioned, I'm like, what? When did that happen? I remember I was so nervous that day. And I, I'm pretty sure my wife was nervous too, but I was really, really nervous. You think about all the things that happened and especially the men tonight. You think, you think when you saw that bride coming down the aisle, Let's say she comes down the aisle and she stops everything right when her dad is walking her there and they say, who gives this woman in marriage and all that? And he says, mother and I do. And she stops and she says, now wait a minute before we go any further. I've decided that I don't want to marry him. I want to marry him. <laughs> what do you think the crowd would do if something like that happened? You know, this is kind of the picture of what he's saying here. John the Baptist said, look, Jesus is there to meet the bride. And the bride doesn't walk down the aisle and say, I want to marry John the Baptist. No, the bride walks down the aisle looking for Jesus, looking at Jesus, and is ready to marry Jesus. And John said, when that time comes, guess what happens to the best man? He's gone. He doesn't follow the couple to the honeymoon. He, he doesn't hang around and get on everybody's nerves. No, John said he is the bride and he must, or he is the groom. He must increase and I'm going to decrease. I've done my job. My job was to help with anything that I could help with the wedding, to be there for the groom, and I'm done. It's interesting to me that even John the Baptist knew the importance of this relationship that Jesus would, be, would have with his people and his bride. So, sort of a neat idea. Let's move on to letter C. He said, third, the husband is the head of the wife. There was a man who was married to his wife for about 10 years and they were both in the military. And she had an accident and she was blind. This shook their whole family. I mean, she had small children and all of a sudden she can't see. For a year, she was in depression. She was struggling. She's thinking, I can't ever go to work again. How am I going to take care of my children? I can't even see anything. So finally she decides she's not going to let this thing beat her. She told her husband, she said, I want to go back to work. And she did. She found a job, something that she could do. She's making a decent salary even though she's blind. Her husband didn't know how in the world she was going to get to work every day. You know, he couldn't take her to work every day. So she said, I'll tell you what, I'll take the bus. I'm not scared. I'll take the bus. I'll, I'll do whatever it takes for me to make this happen. I have got to feel like I'm contributing to this family. So she did. Her first day, she got on the bus. She rode who knows how many, 10, 20 miles to work. She got off the bus at her bus stop. 
and her husband was there watching her. She had no idea he was there. He stood across the street on the corner. He made sure that she went in safely. And every single day that she went to work, guess who was there? That's what the head of the wife does. A lot of times when people read the verse, the husband is the head of the wife, you know what they think? They get to tell everybody that they're the king. It is true. God's made them the leader. God has made the man the ruler of that house, but he did not make him a dictator. And if a man wants to lead his house properly, he's got to do it out of love. If a husband wants to be the man that God wants him to be, he will handle his position correctly. And if a wife wants to be the woman that God wants her to be, she will submit herself correctly. Something I tell young people, I ask them, what are you looking for in a person that you want to marry? In fact, we were talking about this in the Philippines. One of our classes was about uh, sort of along this line. And I asked the young people's class, I, I asked a girl, I said, what kind of man do you want to have? You know what she said? A rich one. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> Seriously, you know, of course. You want somebody to take care of you, provide your needs. But anyway, we talked for a minute. And before you go, hold on just a second, before you go, I said, ladies, you need to ask yourself, can you submit to him? All right, thank you.